It's great to be out here. Um, I have one complaint. The worst thing about coming from the West Coast to the East Coast, especially as a government official, is that we're supposed to uphold these standards of decorum in the White House. So normally I'd be wearing a tie. I felt weird coming out in a tie, but I want you to know I have it. And if my speech gets really boring, I'll show you how to tie a bow tie as opposed to talking about internet policy. Um, so I was invited to talk about privacy, and we'll come to that uh, in just a little bit. But I want to frame a somewhat larger question, which is the question, what does the internet look like to governments outside the United States, and how are we in the Obama administration approaching the challenge of keeping the inter internet an open and frictionless global platform? To begin with, let's just look at the question, why should we be worried about internet policy around the world at all? We've done a pretty good job in the United States of framing an open, pro-innovation internet environment, and besides, isn't the internet supposed to take care of itself without help from the government? In the near term, the ability for the internet to function as an open platform, both in the United States and around the world, is a question of jobs from our perspective and of global competitiveness for the United States. A recent McKinsey Global Institute study found that for every job lost to some kind of internet-driven restructuring, 2.6 new jobs were created. We know from US government statistics also that the IT sector overall sees job growth at four times the pace of the economy as a whole. But the internet, we know, is about much more than jobs. It's also a crucial platform for democracy, science, education, and culture. At the United Nations General Assembly meetings last month in which all of the world's leaders gathered, President Obama joined with 31 countries in celebrating their commitment to open government principles, open data, open access, all of which we think are essential uh, to the flourishing of democracy in the internet age. And in the long run, we know that the internet is an indispensable open platform for innovation. Since M Mitch Kapor, who knows who, anyone not know who Mitch Kapor is? Okay, good. That would not be true in the East. Um, <laughs> um, but since Mitch coined the term open platform in 1992, actually to help policymakers understand how to promote the nascent online economy, We've seen the flowering of one platform after another, early interactive services like AOL and CompuServe, the internet, the World Wide Web, open source and proprietary operating systems, social networking platforms, mobile apps, uh, and of course the new generation of web apps based on HTML5. So if we care about the internet economy jobs, if we care about uh, uh, the democratic environment that the internet enables, we have to keep it open. And if we care about opportunity for future innovation in the United States and around the world, we need a globally open internet. But those who've been paying attention to the global tide of internet policy uh, over the last 15 years will know that the laissez-faire, hands-off approach to the internet that the United States promoted in the 90s and that many other countries followed is being reevaluated by governments around the world. Many governments are taking a more activist, hands-on role. Now, your mind probably goes to China, Iran, repressive regimes seeking to stem the tide of the Arab Spring or cover up corruption. But what about countries that hold web hosts responsible for any harm done by third-party content that they host? What about regulations that would require explicit consent for any third-party cookie? What about prohibition on offering cloud services in a country if the data is stored outside of that country? I'm not going to name names, but these are all uh, uh, reference to laws that are e either in place or are being actively discussed. And in many cases, they're being discussed by some of the, the most progressive, most democratic of our allies. This means that we have to take their concerns seriously and not just dismiss them as those who somehow don't get it. What's behind the global tendency to clamp down on the freedom and openness that has made the internet so successful? I want to point to three things. First of all, the five billion people around the world who are not online yet. Second of all, uh, the reality of national borders. And third, what I think is a growing trust gap in a number of countries. As the world's population hits the seven billion mark this month, we realize that while the first billion and a half internet users came online incredibly quickly as compared to other media, uh, there are still over five billion members of the Earth's population wondering who's looking out for their interests online in the internet environment. Remember that the internet was created and is still shepherded along by a very unusual 
a set of non-governmental institutions, the Internet Engineering Task Force, the World Wide Web Consortium for Technical Architectures, organizations that, like ICANN that coordinate things like domain names and IP addresses. The United States and many of the more developed economies are comfortable with these institutions, but other countries wonder how do they get involved with these organizations and should they trust them? Some think that it might be better to hand the Internet's management and governance over to the United Nations, uh, where each country can have its say. I don't know how you feel about that. We'll, we'll come back to that later. Uh, the Internet and the World Wide Web, as we know, are relentlessly global. The build once, deploy globally development style provides essential economies of scale for web-based businesses. However, many countries are wondering about whether globally deployed services have the effect of avoiding local laws. Can a country that opens its borders to all incoming internet services and outgoing data protects its citizens, their culture and their values? Think about this one example. In response to the uh, Google Street View Wi-Fi data leakage, over one quarter of a million German citizens exercised their right to have the images of their home, of the front of their homes, of their facades, uh, uh, blurred out in Street View. Those who pay attention to opt-out rates know that that's actually a really big number, so it must mean something. Uh, and in fact, there's even a German word uh, for this so-called right to be pixelated. Verpixelungsgerecht. Uh, I probably didn't say that right. Um, uh, uh, as a government, if you aren't protecting, if you aren't offering basic protection to your citizens, you've failed. So governments are seeking ways to increase trust online. Now, there's no doubt that bringing the rule of law to the internet environment is a good thing, and as governments, we've been working on it from the very beginning. But it has to be done in a way, as far as we're concerned, that preserves global scalability and interoperability. To do this, we're pioneering a new style of law and regulation tuned to the globally fast-paced internet economy. Just this month, we've seen the power of voluntary agreements to solve problems more rapidly than traditional regulation in two areas that I want to highlight. First, uh, uh, you heard mention of, of health information uh, uh, being so valuable and important uh, in, in the internet environment. Um, uh, the Department of Health and Su Human Services just recently used this new style of regulation to close a critical privacy gap for personal health record systems. It ends up that these personal health record systems aren't covered by current privacy law. So rather than go back and, and, and try to amend the law, which, believe me, takes an awfully long time, the Health and Human Services Department got together with the, the, electronic, with the personal health records systems, with privacy advocates, and with regulators, and got them to agree to a voluntary code of conduct that is enforceable at the Federal Trade Commission. We think this is a much more rapid and flexible way to address internet policy problems as they come up. And just uh, at the beginning of this week, we announced that the mobile phone industry has developed tools that will help hundreds of millions of mobile phone users avoid bill shock, that sinking feeling when you, when you, when you look at your bill and you discover that you exceeded your data plan uh, rates somewhere in the middle of the month. So, so the industry got together with, um, uh, 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 with, with the, the Federal Communications Commission and others and developed a code of conduct that, that provides that all mobile phone operators will send uh, users uh, messages of some sort when they're beginning to exceed their bills. The alternative was for the FCC to issue a set of rules, the industry to go to court and have a fight about whether the FCC was allowed to issue those rules and Congress to get into the act, and years later we would still have had no protection for consumers. We're also using this flexible policy-making model to address consumer privacy protection. We do this with a combination of law that establish basic principles and then a multi-stakeholder process of developing codes of conduct that provides agility. So we're the first administration in history, as far as I can tell, that has actually called on Congress to pass a new consumer privacy protection law to provide individuals clear rights in how their personal information is handled. However, we propose to implement these protections through a new internet-style system of enforceable codes of conduct. This is necessary because in order to keep pace, in order to, to keep the internet open and innovative, we need rules that can match its speed and its scale. One well-known regulatory agency, uh, not the Federal Trade Commission, who you'll hear from later, uh, has recently said that it takes them six years to, to go through the whole cycle of writing a set of rules. Six years ago, there was no Facebook. 
Six years before that, there was no Google. So, so we can see that we need something quicker. Um, Second, we're also reaching out to our allies and trading partners to build support for global open internet policy principles to guide the development of law about the internet. This June, a group of 34 leading economies gathered together with Egypt and South Africa at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Develop Development and adopted a set of fundamental principles to keep the internet open. The principles highlight uh, important fundamentals like protection of the global free flow of information, promoting the open, uh, decentralized internet architecture, transparency, privacy protection, uh, copyright protection, and limiting internet intermediary liability. With these principles in place, we have a core coalition of countries behind the open internet. Once the rules are finalized later this year, new countries that seek to join the OECD in the future, Russia is in the process, and countries like uh, Brazil, India, and China are also interested, um, will have to show that their laws conform to these basic principles of openness. So through these principles, uh, uh, we, we can expect that the, uh, these ideas can go viral around the world. Let me just close by saying that uh, President Obama has led the administration in establishing internet openness as a global priority. Speaking to a group of students when he visited China in 2010, he explained, I can tell you that in the United States, the fact that we have unrestricted internet access is a source of strength, and I think it should be encouraged. The more freely information flows, he said, the stronger the society becomes, because then citizens of countries around the world can co hold their governments accountable. I'd like all of you to think about how you can help continue the dialogue that the president has started. This is, the mo this is most important, I think, with countries and communities that are just beginning to get online. You can reach out and get involved with open government efforts by building a great app using government data. When you're building a new service, think about the way that you're handling personal data and perhaps even engage with consumer advocates on the design choices you make. Our best hope to keep the internet open is to continue in its participatory de design tradition. You can each contribute to that as you build new services, engage and empower your users, and even think about talking to governments every once in a while. We are, as the saying goes, here to help, but sometimes we need to hear from people like you so that we understand how we can help best. So thanks very much, and I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you, Danny.